Hello, everyone. Hello and welcome to Should We Ban the Burqa, an event hosted by the ANU together with the Canberra Times. I'm Lynn Minion, a journalist at the Canberra Times, and I'm here to introduce the debate, which brings together three leading commentators, Virginia Hausiger, uh, Julie Pozzetti, and Dr. Shakira Hussein, or moderated by Professor Hilary Charlesworth. And they'll be looking into a controversial question. For all you Tweety Pies, the event will be live tweeted on Twitter by ANU Media. Anyone can join in the Twitter discussion at Burkaban or hashtag. Those of you with compatible phones can get free access to the ANU wireless system for your Twitter interaction. Username Burka, password at NU Burka. The format of today's proceedings will begin with each panellist speaking for up to 10 minutes to set out their views. Then the discussion will open up to questions and comments from the floor, together with some of the best contributions made via Twitter. The debate will finish up with the panellists providing a brief summary of their positions. Your panellists are Virginia Hausiger, an ABC TV newsreader and a columnist for the, the Canberra Times, wrote in Forum a couple of weeks ago that the burqa should be banned in Australia. Virginia described the burqa as a hideous instrument of control and a tool of patriarchy used to subjugate women. Beside her on the panel is Julie Pozzetti, a former parliamentary press gallery reporter, now a journalism lecturer at the University of Canberra. She's doing her PhD on the way the media portrays Muslim women. Next is Dr. Shakira Hussein, a visiting fellow at the ANU who specialises in gender in Muslim societies. And she's researched in parts of Pakistan where the burqa is worn. And of course, your moderator today is the renowned Professor Hilary Charlesworth, Professor of International Law and Human Rights in the ANU College of Law, an Australian Research Council Federation Fellow, Professor in Regnet and Director of the Centre for International Governance and Justice at the ANU. So let's find out, should we ban the burqa? Many thanks, Lynn, for starting us off. Uh, Lynn has described uh, rules of engagement. I think for today we'll hear from the speakers and we're not going to have questions between them. So please save your questions for uh, the time after that. And uh, we'll try and have questions that are coming to us via Twitter also. So if you can't catch my eye, perhaps you can Twitter it in and the best uh, Twitter questions will come to us. So I'd now like to start without further ado, inviting a face who's very well known to us who watch the uh, television news, uh, Virginia Hausiger, to speak to us. Welcome, Virginia. Thank you, Hilary. I just need to uh, get this going. Thank you, and thank you for coming along today. First, it's necessary for me to make something very clear. I'm here today as a columnist for the Canberra Times, not as an ABC presenter. The ABC does not endorse my view on the burqa, but as a columnist, it gives me the right to express my own view. Those who've come here today hoping to witness a bit of a dog fight or a cat fight are going to be disappointed. Shakira, Julie and I are friends, and we have been for a couple of years. And good friendship sustains a difference of opinions, particularly among women. So, should we ban the burqa? <laughs> Calling for a ban on anything is not something I do lightly, nor does it come easily. This is an uncomfortable place in which I find myself. Yet, 
Here I stand. I can do no other. Like the 16th century Martin Luther, who used those very words, I do not apologise for my writings. I abhor the burqa and the niqab. I hate what these shrouds do to women. I'm appalled that women are separated from the world in this way. I'm a libertarian and I highly value the diversity and the tolerance that is encouraged and supported by a liberal democracy such as Australia. But I'm also a feminist and the burqa is a feminist issue. For too long, feminists and women in general have been silent on this issue. As the niqab began to appear in our cities, mostly we've ignored it. Australians are good at that. As long as she doesn't get in my way, doesn't hurt or harm me, she can wear what she likes. After all, it's her choice, right? Choice is a vexed issue when it comes to the burqa and the niqab. The garment itself is more than just a heavy, enveloping piece of cloth. It is both tool and symbol of an ideology of intolerance and separation. An intolerance of women's liberty and free agency and separation from any society in which women are free. In a Western democracy such as Australia, the, work, the wearing of a burqa and a niqab is sending a very strong message. I can't ignore that message as I see it as a direct attack on something I value deeply, the social, cultural, political and equality of women in Australia. Now, this is not an argument about religion. Over the past couple of weeks, numerous Muslim women, scholars, academics have confirmed that the Quran does not call on women to fully cover their body and face in public in this way or to conceal their identity in this way. This discussion is about the burqa, what it does to women, what it does to freedom and what it does to equality. And my reference to the burqa includes the niqab. I do not put the hijab into the same category. I am not calling for a ban on the hijab or the headscarf and I could not support such a ban. To help illustrate what I'm talking about, I'll use some photos as a backdrop. This first photo shows a woman standing in Kabul. She's wearing the blue burqa that's typically worn all over Afghanistan. This woman is me. I found the burqa. I found the burqa to be extremely difficult to wear. I found I couldn't breathe, see or hear properly. As reported by Lynn Minion in Saturday's Canberra Times, the feisty young Afghan MP Malala Joya also hates wearing the burqa. It's not only oppressive, she says, but it's more difficult than you think. You have no peripheral vision because of the netting in front of your eyes and it's hot and suffocating under there. Malalaya Joya is famed for attacking her fellow MPs and their entrenched misogyny and corruption. As a result, she's been kicked out of Parliament. Now, having survived a number of assassination attempts, the burqa helps her to move about anonymously. It keeps her hidden. As she told journalist Lynn Minion, given the choice, most Afghani women would choose not to wear it. We've had women in tears and tears, she said, as they wish they could wear clothes and that they could enjoy walking in the street without worrying that someone will kidnap them, someone will rape them. In other words, the women in Afghanistan wear the burqa as a defence, as a protection, a kind of fabric shield against a harsh and dangerous world. A world of deep mistrust, a world where political, judicial and religious authority 
is owned by men. A world where public space is owned by men. A world where the rules about women's behaviour and dress are controlled and dictated by men. A world where women are reduced to hiding their faces and cowering. For women in Afghanistan and parts of Pakistan, the world can certainly be a very hostile place. But that world does not exist here in Australia. Australia is not a place where political, judicial and religious authority is owned by men. In Australia, public space is not owned by men. Here, no man has the right to order a woman to cover her face and no woman ought to feel compelled to hide under cover. In Afghanistan, it was put to me that some very poor women prefer wear the burqa because they're ashamed of their ragged clothing underneath. So yes, choice does come into it, sort of. Women there get to choose to wear the burqa out of fear, obedience or shame. Whatever their reason for wearing it, the effect is the same. The burqa renders women anonymous. It depersonalises them. These blue bundles could be a sack of rags or a bag of potatoes. Like the burqa, the niqab is spectacularly successful in depersonalising women. One of France's highest profile Muslim women activists, Fadela Amara, who is Secretary of State for Urban Policies, calls the niqab a tomb for women. She says that the current use of the niqab, or burqa, in her country has gone well beyond just an ostentatious show of religion. The French bipartisan parliamentary push to have the burqa banned has been summed up by MP André Guérin, who says, clothed in a burqa or niqab, a woman is in a situation of reclusion, exclusion and inadmissible humiliation. Australia is not a place that sanctions the exclusion and humiliation of women. But what about free choice? In Australia, we pride ourselves on choice and celebrate our freedom of choice. So what about those women who choose to wear a burqa or a niqab, even though it may restrict their vision and movement and it may be stinking hot under there and hard to breathe under, what about their freedom of choice? Well. Let's look at freedom. In Muslim states where the burqa, niqab or full veil covering is not mandatory, the majority of women choose not to wear it, except of course in places like Afghanistan where lawlessness and fear prevail. Not all choices are good choices. In my view, arranging to marry your 10-year-old daughter to a 21-year-old man is not a good choice. Or a mother subjecting her daughter to a clitoridectomy is not a good choice. And yet, millions of women the world over still choose to do it. Just as not all choices are healthy choices, not all choices are made freely. Which, of course, is a claim that would be hotly denied by Australia's most famous niqab wearer, Rabia Hutchinson. She's the surfy chick from Mudgee who converted to radical Islam with gusto. In Sally Neighbour's fascinating book about Rabia's journey called The Mother of Muhammad, Rabia makes it clear that she chooses to wear the niqab in Australia to amplify her difference and separateness. It's not Australia I hate, she says, it's the system. According to Sally Neighbour, in the mainstream Muslim fraternity, Rabia's full niqab occasioned mild alarm. One of Rabia's early teachers, Sheikh Omran, advised her not to wear the niqab when she was back in Australia as it was unnecessary and provocative. Apparently, Rabia doesn't care. So yes, wearing the niqab for Rabia is her own choice. And in making this choice, she's also making a very loud statement. A statement that says while she hates the Australian system, as she puts it, she instead has embraced a system that demands separation and segregation. A system in which women are natural inferiors to men. A system that says women have no rightful place in the public domain, so must hide themselves. 
a system that is so untrusting of men and their lustful urges that it punishes women for being women and the men roam free. A system in which a woman is nothing without a husband. The system that Rabia is flagging with her none too subtle niqab is not one I can support. The niqab demonstrates a contempt for women. Women are not chattels to be covered. Wearing the niqab is less about piety and more about power. She who wears it has forfeited any individual power she had to a sexist ideology that's designed to advantage men and keep women in servitude. Rather than acknowledge women as a moderating and civilising force in society, the sexist ideology that insists on burqas and niqabs appears terrified of treating women as equals. That system chooses instead to focus on a woman's sex as a corrupting influence that must be kept in check and well covered. This is why such an ideology is at loggerheads with Western democracy, because in such democracies, the women are free. Banning the burqa and the niqab in Australia is necessary to make a clear statement that such sexist ideology is simply not acceptable here. A ban is about sending a message, a message to the world that says, Australia highly values freedom and equality of women. They are treated with respect and dignity and they never, ever need to hide their face and conceal their identity, not in public. In private, they do as they wish. Thank you. Many thanks, Virginia. I'm now going to call on Julie Posetti from the University of Canberra to speak to us. Welcome, Julie. Virginia has already declared that um, she, Shakira, and I are friends, and I'll reiterate that. And I want to begin um, by publicly acknowledging my deep respect for Virginia Hausiger as a woman as a journalist and as a feminist, and uh, I wholeheartedly support her democratic right to express forceful opinions, as she just has, and to do so without being abused by those who might uh, choose to violently disagree. But I'm afraid I can't agree with Virginia on this issue, as a feminist, as a journalist, nor as a researcher of media coverage of Muslim women and its effects. And just before I go on, I too um, have some slides that I want to share with you which I hope will be um, thought-provoking. They include not just images of um, traditional Muslim um, clothing, which may or may not be um, deemed religious, but also some images that I hope will challenge you to think about um, other sorts of covering that we wear in our community that may or may not disguise our face and how we feel about those, just as a means of trying to challenge any um, cultural stereotypes that you might have. But my objections to Virginia's call to ban the burqa are essentially threefold. Firstly, while the principle of free speech, which Australians do hold dear, supports Virginia's right to make such a call, I believe it would be undermined by a ban that so limits a woman's self-expression and freedom of choice. Secondly, I think it smacks of Orientalism and cultural imperialism, and ironically, paternalism. Unfortunately, the language in which Virginia has couched her call, and I'm referring here to the article that she wrote in the Canberra Times, which sparked this debate, um, sees her using language which resonates with xenophobes and racists, and I'll go on to clarify what I mean there. I'm not suggesting for a minute Virginia is herself xenophobic or racist, I want to make that clear now, but the language in which she has couched this call has allowed others to latch onto it as such. Thirdly, activist journalism, I believe, is a valid form of human rights advocacy, but it must be cautiously practised in the context of awareness of impacts on the subjects of such reportage. This is particularly important when, as a reporter, you're sitting on the outside of a cultural or religious group, looking in, or as an anthropologist, um, and when an issue is as sensitive as this one is. Firstly, the freedom of speech issue. 
I am not a fan of the burqa or what it symbolises in fundamentalist Islamic states. No man or woman, for that matter, tells me what to wear. And to appropriate a, a quote from the then banned Steve Biko, the South African anti-apartheid activist, who said, I write what I like, which is what Virginia has done, I wear what I like. And I don't believe the state has a place in a woman's wardrobe, either as an enforcer of dress codes, nor as a prohibitor of them. I'm about to bring a baby girl into the world, on a personal note, and as much as I would be disappointed if she chose to shroud her body in a burqa, in the Australian context, that is, I'm pleased that she'll be born into a country where she can choose to do so, and I'll defend her right to make such a choice should she go that way. I also agree with Malalai Joya, who Virginia quoted, the feminist Afghani politician and women's activist, whose bravely expressed views um, have exposed her even to assassination attempts. She also said, I hate that burqa, but if some women like it because of religious cause or part of a culture, I respect them. It's a personal issue. And I prefer Barack Obama to Sarkozy. He said in his recent Cairo speech, it's important for Western countries to avoid impeding Muslim citizens from practicing religion as they see fit by dictating, for instance, what clothes a Muslim woman should wear. In Australia, a ban on a burqa may also be unconstitutional, potentially contravening section 116 of the Constitution, which states the Commonwealth shall not make any law for establishing any religion or for imposing any religious observance or for prohibiting the free exercise of any religion. Obviously, Hilary Charlesworth, who sits here, will no doubt be able to better interpret the Constitution as it would apply to such a ban. But the evidence suggests that in Australia, the very, very small number of women who choose to wear the burqa, or rather who wear the burqa, do choose to do so independently as a matter of conscience, reflective of religious or cultural values. And to dismiss them, as Virginia did in writing, as being, quote, feeble women who are afraid of modernity, complicit in their own oppression, I find to be patronising um, and a little elitist. And it has the effect of denying them a voice. It's the same denial of voice that um, Virginia believes the burqa suppresses. Secondly, the issue of cultural policing. Apart from the practicalities of how do you go about banning one item of clothing and another, and where does the creep begin and end, and do we get out a tape measure to determine the width allowed for um, a person's face to be revealed, do we go that way? Apart from that, banning the burqa, I believe, would be an, an oppressive act, which would be designed to enforce Western perceptions of liberation. The irony is that far from defending women's rights, it would effectively deny um, those rights and require reliance on what some would say were masculinist and paternalistic systems of government and law enforcement. According to the Western perspective, the burqa is a dehumanising icon of gender oppression, keeping women compliant, silent and submissive. But Saeed's theory of Orientalism posits that Western media typically impose their own intellectual and cultural superiority through reportage of Islamic people and issues and that they regard the Muslim world and its inhabitants as backward, barbaric and outsiders to Western society. And if you read um, Virginia's column, you can see elements of Syed's theory at play there. In her piece, which was titled, Ban the Un-Australian Burqa, Virginia wrote, wearing the burqa or niqab in Australia is an aggressive way of saying, I will not integrate into your society and I care nothing for the cultural mores and social traditions of this country. Instead, the woman wearing it is demonstrating that she would rather submit to gender apartheid than embrace the social norms of this place. The burqa is an arrogant display of disrespect to Australia and the Australian way of life." End quote. As I said, I know for a fact that Virginia is no racist, nor is she a right-wing reactionary, despite what some people have suggested in responses to her column. But the use of such emotive and inflammatory language, which is reminiscent of some of the Howard era commentary on this issue, does allow her valid arguments to be dismissed by her detractors and latched onto by xenophobes as such. And while in the staunchly liberal secular French Republic, there have been as many calls from the left as from the right for a ban on the burqa, 
Um, at this time, of course, it comes from the right in the form of Sarkozy's pitch. In multicultural Australia, where the spirit of egalitarianism has encouraged pluralism, this has been almost exclusively the territory of right-wing commentators and politicians like Fred Nile, who called for a burqa ban in 2002, saying that he feared it was being used to disguise bombs. When his critics pointed out that the same effect could be achieved with an overcoat and a scarf or a ski mask, the PM program on the ABC reported that Fred Nile dismissed this suggestion because in the summer months a coat would be suspicious, as a certain Brazilian found in the UK underground during the, the aftermath of the London bombings. The journalist went on to say, this makes you wonder how Santa will go in his big red suit and beard, posing for photographs with his fans this Christmas. Bronwyn Bishop and Sophie Panopoulos similarly called for an unveiling in public places in 2005, with Bishop implying that women who wear the hijab are unpatriotic non-conformists. She said it's being used by the sort of people who want to overturn our values as an iconic emblem of distance and a point of difference. Now, while they were talking about a ban on the hijab, there are parallels between the two debates about the ban on the burqa and calls for a ban on the hijab. Virginia wrote, Australians must not, or Australia must not allow that radical and overt tool of fundamentalism, the burqa, to be worn here. It defies our cherished values of equality and freedom. But I find this argument a little congruous. How do you enforce equality by denying freedom of choice and freedom of speech? Responding to Fred Niles Burke of Van Call, the then Premier of New South Wales, Bob Carr, issued the following warning. Stereotypes are the first step in actual full-blooded racism. And that's why I find, or well, one of the reasons that I find Virginia's views as expressed in the column that she wrote, particularly the language in which they were couched via a conflation of nationalism and feminism, both a difficult pill, pill to swallow and more seriously, potentially, a, a recipe for the inflammation of xenophobia within a community. The perpetuation of stereotypes such as the suggestion that all women who wear the burqa are concurrently oppressed and threatening, in combination with fear of difference, have exposed Muslim women to racist attacks in Australia. In the aftermath of September 11 and the Bali and London bombings, they were spat on, their veils were ripped off, and they were verbally assaulted. Debates like this can make Muslim women feel at risk rather than liberated. And they can actually put them at risk. In Germany earlier this month, a veiled Muslim woman was stabbed to death in the courtroom she was applying to for justice by the man she accused of vilifying her. And I'm running out of time, so despite my previous career as a broadcaster, apparently I can't keep to it. Um, but if I can move on to media coverage um, of these issues, which is highly relevant because the call came from a, a very credible, respected journalist. So the media coverage of such issues um, as they pertain to women's traditional dress and also to Muslim women in general are particularly relevant. Muslim women are both the, the most highly visible members of one of the most marginalised groups in Western society and possibly the most vulnerable to, to uh, racial vilification and stereotyping. Based on my research in this area over the past few years, which has involved both studying coverage and speaking to Muslim women about their experiences and perceptions of it, I've concluded that there are they are concurrently pigeonholed as terrorist threats, victims of male oppression and sexualised exotic others who struggle to be heard beyond the veil as news media overwhelmingly perpetuate what they describe as ignorant, shallow misrepresentations of them. In the portrayal of Muslim women, attention is frequently focused on the way they dress with their clothing seen as shorthand, sort of symbol of shorthand, if you like, of their threatening alien status. And while they're virtually invisible in mainstream news, when they are appearing, um, they are generally expected to defend their choice of clothing or to comment on the veil or the burqa or whatever the case may be. Most recently, I interviewed and surveyed 18 women from diverse cultural and professional backgrounds, including a number of journalists, about their experiences of the reporting of Muslim women. 17 of the 18 participants were scathing in their criticism of mainstream news and the coverage of Muslim women. 
They cited rampant stereotyping as the biggest problem, highlighting the cliched representations of women as veiled, victims of misogyny and an oppressive regime, subject to polygamous marriages, uneducated, alien, subhuman, unassertive, foreign, fundamentalist, un-Australian, distant and unapproachable as significant causes for concern. The journalists among the participants also complained about rampant stereotyping and many respondents lamented the media's conflation of culture and religion and the reductionist approach to coverage, describing it variously as racist, rubbish, opportunistic, negative, willfully uninformed, stupid and docile. Another issue highlighted was the secondary effect of such coverage, described as the silencing impact which caused Muslim women to feel bound to defend misogynistic men against negative reportage. One respondent summed up the general feeling of participants. She said, the media has invented a stereotype of blind, obedient, colourless women, covered from head to toe in grey, which has nothing to do with real life. They never represent the diversity of Muslim women, our origins, professions, educations, opinions or clothes. Our voices are never heard themselves, just people speaking on our behalf, often typifying us as victims of brutal men. If we don't fit the stereotype, and nearly nobody does, then our views are dismissed as being atypical. The image in the media presents of Muslim women is just nothing like me or any of the Muslim women I know. It's a fantasy of Western ignorance which is reinforced every time it's in the press. And there I shall leave it. Thank you. Many thanks, Julie. And our final speaker is Shakira Hussain. So I'd invite you to uh, welcome Shakira to the podium. So you've heard of not being able to walk and chew gum at the same time, but I can't stand up and think clearly at the same time. So. Okay, so I would like to begin by acknowledging that Virginia has gone out of her way to interact with local Muslims here in Canberra. I can see quite a few faces in the audience who've been at these events that Virginia has attended and she's given of her time to community events as well. And she has also heard our opinions expressed at sometimes interminable length, including by me. So, you know, um, it's a long process, perhaps, but an interesting one. And I'd also like to speak, sort of, there's issues of definitions of what government we're talking about, and I'll just say briefly that really what's under discussion here is any form of veiling the face, whether it's called a burqa or, an, or a niqab or a chador, and there's different garments that cover women's faces and there's different names sometimes applied to the same garment that burqa, Afghan style garment with the net grill across the face is often referred to in Pakistan as a shuttlecock burqa to distinguish it from other kinds of burqas from other, from other forms of achieving really the same effect which is just basically you know, to, to cover, to cover up everything. And so although the discussion today relates to Australia, I'd like to begin by talking about Pakistan. And I acknowledge that it's quite a different act to be covering in Pakistan than here, and there's quite different conditions, but I'll, I'll get to that. There are, it is still a minority of Pakistani women who cover their faces on a full-time basis. There are many Pakistani women, perhaps most, who wear a scarf across their shoulders like this. They may pull it over their hair at some points, and some will also pull it over their faces. You know, at times when they're being made to feel uncomfortable, perhaps when they're under particular scrutiny, or where they feel that they you know, want a little bit more shelter. But there are women who do cover more or less every time they leave their house. And in some cases, historically in Muslim societies, this has been a sign of elitism, that your family has so much income that you're not re really needing to venture out into public life that you 
can afford to stay home, and when you um, leave your home, you're sort of taking a sort of mobile shelter with you. But at the other end of the spectrum, there are women who cover because that's the only kind of privacy they can get. We often talk about a woman's right to participate in public life, and I support that right absolutely. But there are women who've been forced into public life in circumstances that aren't of their choosing. Certainly the shuttlecock burqa in some parts of Pakistan, it's perceived that women wearing that burqa are either beggars or prostitutes. I remember doing interviews among Afghan women in Peshawar and my Afghan contact thought it was important for me to be interviewing uh, some women who'd been reduced to that beggary and finding out how they had come to be in such horrible circumstances. So we looked for the shuttlecock burqas, the beggars, uh, but the first woman we approached turned out not to be a beggar. She turned out to be a prostitute. That's another circumstance in which you might not be really wanting to be recognised, wanting to be seen. Uh, and, uh, you know, and that's, again, women whose homes are really not homes as we'd understand it, um, just makeshift shelters, well, their clothing is, again, the only form of shelter they can get. And once more, I acknowledge that women in Australia are not reduced to those kinds of conditions. This is just background. In Australia also, though, I haven't had much to do with women who habitually cover their faces because it's vanishingly rare among Muslims in Australia. And that is leading many Muslims to wonder why um, an issue that really relates to such a small number is being given such prominence. Muslims in France, incidentally, are asking the same question. And it's my perception from the, you know, by definition, limited contact I've had with these women, and also the perception of, of other people I've been talking to, that the women who do cover their faces in Australia are disproportionately converts as like Rabia Hutchinson, who um, Virginia referred to. And so they're not bringing a custom from their homeland and importing it to Australia. They are adopting a religious norm that in fact isn't followed by most, mo most of the women in Muslim communities here uh, for reasons of their own and some converts are told and do accept that it's praiseworthy or not compulsory to cover your face. I don't think there are any Muslim women or Muslim men come to that who believe it's obligatory on theological grounds to cover your, your face. They think that you will get extra merit, perhaps, some, some, or some think that you'll get extra merit by doing so, but they and, and some also think that it is religiously obligatory to cover your hair, but the face is something else again. So, um, women who cover their faces in Australia are choosing, and again, I accept that there's problematics around that word choice, but they are taking up a form of life that is much more isolating than covering your face can be in Muslim countries. I spent a lot of time in Pakistan with women who belong to an, a religious political movement, and these women do habitually cover their faces around unrelated men, but that isn't very much of their time. And they can lead quite full professional lives while doing so. They work in women's only schools or healthcare centres or offices. Uh, they participate in the political life of their parties. They hold public demonstrations, fully veiled, of course, and the veil, by the way, helps to mitigate the transgression of holding a street demonstration. So, um, but in Australia, of course, you're either going to be covering your face every time you leave your home or you're not going to be leaving your home very much. And you're not going to be mixing with very many people. In Pakistan, you could be mixing with quite a lot of unrelated, well, quite a lot of related men too, because there are likely to be a lot of closely related men in your vicinity and in your household. And certainly you would be 
doing a lot of mixing with other women. I barely ever saw my Pakistani contacts who covered their faces. Well, I barely ever saw them with their face veil on. We were nearly always in places where it was unnecessary. In following those norms in Australia, you would feel it necessary to be covering your face much more of the time. So I would certainly be discouraging my daughter if she wanted to start covering her face. I'd be discouraging her from doing so, although frankly, looking at her sitting there and looking at the look on her face, I don't think there's much <laughs> chance of that. <laughs> but, um, but another thing I think we need to acknowledge in this discussion is that it can be hard sometimes to muster much enthusiasm to support the right of women to choose to cover when a great many of those women don't support the inverse right, the, the flip side of that. They don't support the right of women in Muslim majority societies to uncover. And in this case, we're talking about their hair, not their faces. They're very clear that they do support their entitlement not to cover their faces. And again, thinking of my Pakistani context, the issue of the, the headscarf in France and the fact that you are not allowed to wear it into, in public schools, it was hugely important to them. They talked about it all the time and they held demonstrations with their faces covered, of course, outside the French embassy. And in, the, in all discussions about Islam and the West, it was very high on their agenda. But they supported the right of their party, which was in power in one of the provinces, to insist that women in government jobs did have to cover their hair. They did support their, their entitlement to be telling other women in Pakistan how they had to dress. So their definition of choice was only running one way. But I don't feel that I'm entitled to be demanding reciprocity when standing up for choice. I think that's an absolute value. And as long as they are not actively um, interfering in the lives of other women, then that's all that I can demand of them. And I can demand, perhaps, well, certainly demand that they should allow other women the same choice, but I can't respond to that by taking away their choice. My response to that has to be to do with that argument. I can't extend that into saying, well, if you're not letting me choose, or if you're not letting women in Iran choose, or women in the northwest frontier of Pakistan choose, well, I'm taking away your choice too. And it makes it more difficult to have discussions about women's right not to have to cover, when the flip side of that is always, well, you know, the government in France feels perfectly entitled to tell us that we can't wear headscarves in certain public spaces. If they're allowed to tell us that we can't cover, then we're absolutely allowed to lay down the rules in our societies and tell women that they do have to cover. So it kind of undermines discussions about women's entitlements in Muslim-majority countries when Muslims claim that free expression of their religious norms is not permitted in our societies. So I'd finish off by saying, since it's you know, the French context that's really kicked off this round of discussion, I'll paraphrase, not Voltaire, but I'll paraphrase somebody who apparently put words in Voltaire's mouth, and I'm assured that Voltaire never said that he'd support, that he would support, that he, sorry, he might not agree with what you said, but he'd support to the death your right to say it. I might not agree with what you choose to put on, but I'll support to the death your right to put it on. And I won't particularly expect you to support my rights to the death in return. to move the chairs and sit uh, panel style, I think, along here. So.
Virginia, I'd just like to start with you as the first speaker. I was very struck by uh, the fact your photos and your talk clearly, but please correct me if I'm wrong here, that the impetus for this, uh, for your position here was your visit to Pakistan. So the, the, the question, uh, and yet the debate we've been having is whether we should ban it in Australia. And as Shakira has pointed out, uh, you know, we're, we're switching context. But my question is, um, your idea of banning it, would that extend, are you speaking just in an Australian context, or would you, were you able to have, you know, would, would you also be calling for a worldwide ban? I just wanted to, to ascertain that. Okay, look, great question. Firstly, I didn't go to Pakistan. Uh, I visited Afghanistan. Sorry, but no, my that's mistake. right. Yep, my my uh, first confrontation with the burqa, the niqab, the chadal, the, uh, um, the abaya was back in 91 when I first visited um, Malaysia uh, and spent some time working in Trangano. And as those who are from Malaysia would know, that's a, a very Islamic state and a lot of the women fully cover, although they show their face. My next um, experience was in Iraq and my recent experience in Afghanistan. But my issue with the burqa, the coverage of face, has been a long-held view. Um, <clears throat> my visit to Afghanistan uh, had nothing to do with my interest in the burqa. Um, my research there was on another issue, but uh, naturally it was something that, um, that uh, influenced me, not only because I, I put it on myself at one stage, but oh, I wore a veil the whole time I was there, only when I was out in public, when I was indoors, I was uh, the only woman among the women I was with who didn't veil. Um, which was very interesting because I, I was working with a number of orphans and I had a number of the girls say to me a number of times, why don't you veil? I think I was probably the first woman they have ever seen who has um, shown her hair uh, and not, not worn a veil. Now, in answer to your question, am I looking at a, a worldwide ban or an Australia ban? Very much an Australia ban. I don't care what the rest of the world does. That's up for them. That's up for the United States. It's up for Sarkozy and, and the French. The Turkish, uh, we know, have a very strong view on this. The hijab is not allowed in universities and public offices. Uh, we know that it is mandatory in Iran to, to wear a head veil. It is up to each state, each nation, to decide this for themselves. In Australia, I think we need to take a position on this because I think it's a very important issue. And I think it's very much, in, uh, it confronts us, uh, the, the very values that I've talked about, particularly in relation to women, equality and freedom. So what I'm talking about is a call for Australia to ban this as a message. If the rest of the world wants to hear that message, fine, good. But this is for Australia to say, you know, we don't accept this in our country. We do not accept women covering themselves and concealing themselves and covering their face and eyes in public because it is not necessary in our country. It is not necessary in our country. This is a country that is a liberal democracy. So, in answer to your question, Australia. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for making that so clear. <laughs> the no, question for Julie. I, I was very struck listening to you uh, that one of your main messages was one focusing on freedom of choice, which is a very, a very, very strong one there. Uh, but it made me wonder, well, would you, at what staged we say people have freedom of choice so for example i think one of the images that was up there was of a young girl perhaps looking perhaps about 12 or 13 wearing uh, a burqa uh, but but at what stage would do we recognize freedom of choice so for example should we accept uh girls of 10 11 12 being clothed in a burqa by their parents how does freedom of choice operate in that particular context well, I guess if we allow women at the age of whatever consent to determine what they do with their bodies, mm -hmm. then um, you know we can make the same determination around how they choose to dress. But I, I don't see. Um, look, let me take a, a personal example. My mother imposed a rule on me growing up. She didn't want me wearing black, although you're sartorially <laughs> flanked in it today. She felt that it was inappropriate. Um, I fought with her about it. Um, I didn't win because she bought my clothes. You know, I don't. Um, I don't actually. I don't actually think that in a setting in Australia where a young girl is um, instructed by her mother to wear a burqa, that it, that that is a good enough example um, to cite for justification for imposing a ban across the board. I, I, I'm not. I'm not. 
right. supporting ban. I'm simply trying to work out where freedom of choice cuts in. For example, this yeah. is a very real issue. Let me give you a particular case in the United Kingdom. You probably know these cases. A series of cases where uh, young girls at school in the United Kingdom were wearing full facial coverings. Yeah. Uh, the school said this is uh, inconsistent with our clothing code. Uh, you may not attend school. And one of these uh, young girls, uh, then her case was taken up right up to the House of Lords. Interestingly, her case was argued by Cherie Booth uh, as her barrister. Uh, and the House of Lords finally said, uh, no, there is, a, there is a school clothing policy that would allow you to wear much Islamic clothing, but it doesn't allow you to cover your... Face. I'm just wondering where where would you stand? There was a dissent in the House of Lords. I don't know if you'd be with the majority or would you be with the dissenter? Should we allow? Should schools allow uh, school-aged girls to wear a burqa to school? I think this is an interesting question about whether you and we, we haven't gotten onto that. Whether you impose a ban across the board or whether you allow, um, as as occurs in um, states like Turkey, for example, and France in 2004, um, it was banned to wear a burqa in public places. So. There are you know, limitations without a total ban. That's, that's one way to look at it. I'm hedging because, <laughs> because I am not I'm not comfortable with the idea of a ban at all. And I've also spoken to women sub-18, so young, young school-age women, who have said that they have made their choice. They identify strongly with the act of covering as, and I'm not talking about um, young women wearing the niqab here, I'm talking about quite conservative forms of, of cover, the jilbab and um, a full headdress and so on. So in that, in that context, I think the reference must be made first to the individual mm. and secondly, obviously, to school or, or societal regulations around public buildings. We have to respect those. I still would feel uncomfortable about, just as uncomfortable about enforcing um, a regulation which prevented them from <coughs> wearing what either they chose or what their parents chose to send them to school in um, than I would with the idea of um, you know, a choice, yeah, a choice being um, withdrawn from them by their parents. Okay, thank you. Do you want to comment on that, or what's it? Uh, well, look, I will. I, I don't want to sidetrack this, but I'm just a bit um, concerned that we're getting a, a little bit. Um, we've muddied the waters when we talk about bales. When I saw images of brides and. Um, um, yeah, look, I, and brides, and I think there were mannequins at, um, in Venice or something like that with masks. What I'm talking about is a burqa, a niqab, that covers, obscures a woman's identity and face, okay? I'm not talking about the hijab. Quite frankly, I quite like the hijab, uh, and I respect the hijab enormously. But um, the burqa, the niqab, and a chador, if that also just gives you a letterbox covering, that's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about that level of, of different different level of, of covering that is in fact deemed religious and goodness gracious I accept that. I'm talking about the thing that covers up a woman based on an ideology of mistrust and based on an ideology of, of women being concealed. That's what I'm talking about. Sorry, you Sorry, you yeah, <laughs> I just briefly respond to that. The images um, that Virginia refers to, I deliberately put them up there. They were provocative, but it must be remembered that the veil in the context, as we refer to it, and veil is the term that is often used generically to refer to various forms of, of um, head cover and face cover in, in Islamic um, settings. Um, but the veil that we walk down the aisle in that covers our face before it's lifted off, and it could be variously opaque or, um, or, trans or transparent, is designed to imply that we are chattels being given over to our husband and then we're now being revealed to the but world. But with respect, that's just a, th a theoretical argument about a costume that has nothing to do with what we're talking about when we're talking about I the think, burqa. I think it does. <laughs> of support there, which is great. <laughs> <laughs> we do love each other, believe it or not, we do. We just have a difference of opinion and we're allowed to. I think it is relevant in that we have to look at the cultural origins of various traditions and we have to, if we're going to be prepared to judge other cultures, examine our own traditions and what we submit ourselves to. Um, at the same time, issues around um, obscurity, obscu you know, if you ban the burqa, what are we, what are we going to ban next? I mean, in Venice, that was a picture of somebody, somebody in um, a face mask in Venice at Carnivale. I mean, literally, how do you write a law that, that prohibits that? Okay, I have um, to say, with regard to issues that are raised about, you know, that bank robbers might start using it, 
I really can't see, you'd be hiding your face, but the other um, fabric that goes with it, you'd be flat out getting out the door. They wouldn't need the security <laughs> camera, you'd have tripped over it. I mean, just a, a tip for any wannabe bank robbers out there, I'd, 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 I'd find something else. <laughs> okay, I, I have now, and then there will be uh, questions from the audience, but I just also, Shakira, I was very interested in your very subtle take on the idea of freedom of choice, and this, this has come up in a whole range of ways in, in what, what is freedom of choice. Struck, uh, there's a legal scholar, an Algerian legal scholar, Karima Benoun, who's written quite a lot. Uh, she has supported, for example, the Turkish laws and so on, which are much more, you know, which are simply just a, the headscarf. But one of the points she makes, and I just wonder what your reaction in thinking about freedom of choice was, because you ended with that ringing call saying, well, look, I, I do respect freedom of choice. I, I understood that to be the basis of your argument. You can correct me in a minute yeah. if I'm wrong. And, but my question would be following on that. What about an argument such as put by people like Karima Benoun? Well, actually, uh, the fact that a society allows full coverage of a face actually allows, her argument is, men within a family will often use the fact that this is tolerated in the society to force their sisters uh, to wear such a covering. So I'm just wondering, given that you've got such deep experience uh, in different communities, how, how would you respond to that type of argument? Look, I, I am uncomfortable with framing it all around this, this word choice because I do accept that Muslim women you know, in communities here and in communities overseas, there's so many pressures coming on them in, from different directions that their choice is not exercised like fully autonomously and but and I completely accept that they some women who are choosing not to wear hijab say because it will inhibit their employment prospects for example well that's a choice on one level but it's a choice among between unemployment or head covering you know not the choice that they'd necessarily like so, so bringing but I think that you have to allow women to negotiate their own way among these you know, competing pressures. And it's not for outsiders to tell them how they ought to do that. What people from outside can do is offer support when they need it. For example, if they're locked in the kind of family relationship where, where fathers or brothers or whatever are being unacceptably dictatorial, then we need to make sure there's shelters for them to go to, for any woman to go to, that we need to make sure that, well, that immigration laws, for example, are such that they don't feel that leaving their relationship will you know, um, mean that they won't be able to stay in the country. There's all these other little support mechanisms. But, I mean, people working on domestic violence, for example, learn pretty fast that you can't make a woman leave a violent relationship until she's ready to go. And um, that's, this is kind of an extrapolation of that, that really you can't make a woman be... Um, you can't force liberation on people. But I do accept, as I said, that, that, that yeah, that the choice is a, is, a, is a difficult word to be wielding when there's so many competing pressures. Thank you very much. So now I'm going to invite questions from your... Yes, I'll just... So we, we might need a microphone Thank you. Um, my name is Dakane, and um, I guess I'd like to offer my opinion from an intensely personal point of view. Um, obviously, a Muslim woman. Um, my family background is um, of Afghan origin, um, but I've lived in Australia my whole life. Um, but really, I think I want to offer my point of view just as a member of society, because I think there are some fundamental um, human rights at stake here if we do go with the pro-banning, the burqa um, stance. Um, Virginia, you make the sweeping statement 
that um, in Western countries women are free. And I think that that's blatantly flawed because if it were true, there would be no need for feminist movements. Um, it's true that Australia highly values a uh, woman's choice, um, but don't you see the irony in taking away that choice to empower her? And I also feel like you mentioned that Australia is a liberal, liberal democracy, but it's almost as though there's a disclaimer there. It's a liberal democracy only if we're told, only if we behave exactly as we're expected by the mainstream. Um, and I can tell you now that any woman who is forced not to wear a burqa, has that freedom of choice taken away from her, will not tear the burqa off and shout out her liberation to the world, but rather she'd retreat further into her home, preferring, to leave, preferring not to leave the home than to leave her burqa and her beliefs behind, as rightly or wrongly as her beliefs and convictions seem to us. Um, so I think that it comes down to the fact that it's not so much the burqa that is un-Australian, as you say, but rather your call for a ban that is un-Australian. Yeah, I'll respond to that. Thank you, Dakani. I, um, look, I think you make some good points, and certainly you're right. I mean, we talk about freedom of women in Australia and freedom of women in the West, and goodness gracious, I'm the first to say it's not true, is it? But we strive for it, and unfortunately, yes, we still do need active feminist movements because of that. Look, it, as I said, it, a ban is not something I feel comfortable with, and the, the, ch the issue of choice is a very vexed issue. Goodness gracious, I've written a whole boy book on choice. It's a very difficult issue when it comes to women and their choice. I guess it comes back to, um, I do believe that, uh, and as Shakira has, has quite rightly pointed out, we are talking about a very small minority, of course. Um, I mean, I've only seen uh, one uh, woman recently in Canberra wearing the full niqab, um, certainly more in Sydney, but only one here. So we're talking about a minority, but it's that minority that I'm targeting to say, what is this burqa, uh, niqab, what is this about? Why is this woman covering in this way? Now, as she walks with her husband, my understanding of that is because her husband does not want her to be seen in public, all right? Why is that? What is that culture of mistrust about? That's what I'm targeting. Why is that woman reduced to her sex and that being unacceptable to be on display in Australia? That's what I'm targeting. Okay. But this, this is a, I'll repeat what Dukhani said, is it's condescending and patronising to assume that this woman is uh, being compelled and it is not her choice. That's a very fair, fair point. And you know what? I think that yes, there is a cut-off point at which I say to some women, you are wrong, you are contributing, you are complicit in your own subjugation. Women do make bad choices. We all make bad choices. As I said, some women choose to arrange a marriage for their 10-year-old daughter to a 21-year-old man. The woman who did that lives in Australia, Rabia Hutchinson. Later on, she says, I, I underestimated the negative effect it would have on my daughter. Some people do make wrong choices, and for that small group of women who are in that group, some of them, I believe, probably feel compelled. Now, it's interesting, you know, Shakira says we, allow, we need to allow women to negotiate their own way. How can a woman who comes from a very strong background, where within her small community, She's in, she is required to fully cover, fully wear a niqab or burqa. How could she go to her husband or father and say, you know what, I'm negotiating my own way, I'm not wearing this anymore. We know, we know that within those very small communities, women don't have that power of negotiation. They do not have that power of voice. That's why I'm saying, yes, as a feminist, I come across the top there and I say to all those men who are running those communities, you know what, we do not accept that behaviour here. It's not good enough. First of all, it is a bit of an innovation the way that it's being worn in Australia because, as I said, it, you're wearing it a lot more of the time. These issues about we wearing it in schools, they don't arise in Muslim countries because, I mean, of course we have single-sex schools here, but there still tend to be males walking around, you know, still tend to be male members of staff. And so there have been, as, as Hilary mentioned, cases of, you know, girls and teaching assistants too, wanting to wear it. 
And responding to that by saying, oh, there's heaps of teachers wear it in Saudi Arabia, I think is not quite to the point because they're not wearing it while they're teaching and I accept that. Um, I think that if you are wearing it and then you are accepting these limitations of employment and, you know, and participation and the thing is when we start to have conversations about banning it, then Muslim women, I haven't spoken to any, whether they wear hijab or not, any women who aren't really uncomfortable with face failing in Australia and who wouldn't be arguing just as hard as me with, with their daughters, their sisters, their cousins, whoever, if they wanted to start wearing it. But when we start talking about bans, then we feel that we have to defend their entitlement to do so. If we don't defend the decision, but we do defend the entitlement, and it's a distraction. It sort of pushes us into ways of talking, pushes us into ways of saying, well, well there's a positive side to gender segregation, which I mean, there is. Everyone wants to get away from men now and again. Like, <laughs> come on. You know, it's rude. It can be. But that women's space can be very nurturing and very warm and, you know. And it's not my natural position in life to be defending face failing and defending gender segregation. That's not my usual position. But when it comes under this kind of attack and when Muslims also start to feel that once again it's an issue that's particular to them and so they're being singled out again, then we have to have this, we have to adopt a way of speaking that, that isn't our normal way of holding conversations. Thank you. I've, I've, got, I've got one question for Julie from Twitter, so I want to make those Twitter people feel it was worthwhile sending in a question. So it's, if there are so few uh, women wearing the burqa in Australia, uh, why is it so much the focus of media? What, what are your yeah. thoughts about that? Good question, Twitterverse. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think this is really, really essential. Um, and that's what's being reflected in, in the conversations I've had with Muslim women as part of my research is this frustration, this sense of um, alienation, the sense of need to self-justify, the loss of independent um, identity construction that comes with a media fixated with issues particularly around dress. And one of my instinctive reactions um, against the idea of um, having such um, a public debate and such, such widespread media coverage about such a minority issue which further marginalises the most marginalised, if you like, is that as much as I value um, um, freedom of speech and as much as I think it's the, the media's right and obligation to report these issues, what has tended to happen historically, and I think this is another example, is that we get hooked on a sexy issue, a ban of a piece of clothing that covers up a woman. It's dead sexy from a journalist's point of view. Okay? It, it's, you know, it's full of conflict and contradiction. Um, but what it tends to do is make the women who, um, Shakira is one of them, who are absorbing all of this um, discussion, forced into a position where everybody wants to talk to them only about one thing. What do you think about the burqa? What do you think about the hijab, if that's the debate on the record? And I'm not saying we shouldn't have these discussions or that we shouldn't report them, but we need to be mindful of the impacts when we do so. And one of the things, um, I didn't get a chance to mention this, so I shall take the opportunity to do so now um, while I was talking, that has been highlighted in research around coverage of, um, of Afghanistan is the, the Western media's fixation with unveiling as a symbol of liberation. Okay, now some research by a woman called Shahira Fahmy into the Associated Press um, photo archive found that only 1% of the photographs that were taken um, by AP photographers, which is a big resource for journalists worldwide, reflected this idea of women actually you know, showing their face. So showing face or hair represented 1% of photographs. Overwhelmingly, the, woman, the women kept their burqas on, which went against um, you know, the supposed justification for those wars in Iraq and Afghanistan being um, justified in, in part around you know, this symbol of women's liberation, the removal of the burqa. What happened was, although that small percentage in reality existed in the photo archives, was that the Western media frequently used those images to tell stories about women's liberation that distorted reality. And so again, you know, this constant association. Now the concern that the, Afghanist the, 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 the Afghan women who were interviewed as part of that research um, expressed reflects what, what I've found here in Australia. And that is that the constant fixation on, on veiling actually shrouds the deeper issues 
to do with injustice and inequality, to do with violence and so on. It takes the attention off the bigger underlying issues and, and shorthands it um, to a symbol which sidetracks us in these debates. And to follow up what um, Dukhani, I think, might have alluded to, the idea of, of women feeling targeted um, by society, partly as a result of um, media debates and partly as a result of such calls to ban, which has an impact on you know, the community, which gets very heated about these issues, is that they withdraw and they retreat. Now, what worse fate can you imagine f f you know, for a woman who is being forced to wear the burqa and the niqab, who is trapped in a violent situation at home, that she feels that she cannot leave that home at all. I would much rather see a society where the woman can at least exit and have the chance, you know, the opportunity to engage with other women um, than, than the alternative, which would be to force her, um, whether that be through a sense of um, her own compunction or, or being compelled to do so by somebody else. That very quickly, um, well, two things, three things, but I'll, I'll go to two. Firstly, in Afghanistan, I'm a bit confused by what you say. I think it's a very ivory tower kind of point of view about the perspective of the burqa. Having just been there, and as a, a media person, and I had two photographers with me, we came back with 5,000 photos. I used some of them up there, but uh, most of our photos show women with their face. That's, that's one point. When the media there is not talking about the burqa, the media there is talking about the corruption, the poverty and the fight. Women there are wearing the burqa, despite the theoretical discussion we could have at length about why, uh, why the Allied forces moved in the first place. Women there are covering up because they are afraid. It is dangerous. They don't know who the person next to them is. It, it is as simple as that. It's, it's not a gender issue. Um, and one other thing I'd, I'd like to touch on, when you talk about, you know, we're going to be confining women to their home, if we have a ban on burqa and niqab, let's keep it a burqa and niqab, we're going to confine women to their home. What about the message we're giving to their husbands and fathers that this is not acceptable in Australia? They need to sort it out and they need to know that if, they, if their women are going to function in Australia, if they're going to go shopping, if they're going to go down the street, if they're going to go to the mosque, that they can't wear a face covering. That's something that they then have to sort out. If they're going to keep their women in prison in their homes, that's something for them to work out and their women too. My question is why on earth would the women be there in the first place? I think that's, that's a very complex issue and women who've experienced domestic violence or worked with women who've experienced domestic violence will say that's an oversimplification of the reality, that a woman may not have a choice um, when it comes to whether or not she is able to escape. That, that issue aside, I think um, you know, we, we, we have to think about the implications of trying to force a man to do what what you say you know, he should do in reference to his home as they manifest for the woman herself. What's more important, the symbol or the reality? Yes, I, mean, I think there are plenty of crimes on the book relating to these situations of men not letting women do things. If he says that there'll be violence if she doesn't dress a certain way or if she tries to leave the house, well, that's against the law already and we should be targeting those actions, we should be targeting actual manifestations of force, of intimidation, than these things which, which we might claim symbolise them, because they may not, and it, it's sort of projecting rather to say that the scarf is the, is, is the intimidation. You know, the, the telling you you have to wear it, that's the intimidation and we can prosecute that with, with difficulty as domestic violence cases are always sticky, are always hard, but it's not, you know, the difference here is ethnicity, the fundamental root issue is not. I'm very conscious that there are lots and lots of people who ask questions, but we only have, we've got three more minutes and I wanted to give our three generous panellists the chance just to sort of wrap up. So I'm really, I do apologise that it's not been possible to take more questions, but I think the debate will continue, no doubt, on Twitter. I only discovered Twitter yesterday, so it's... Uh, <laughs> I'm going to have all my essays delivered in Twitter form, so it'll be very easy to grade them, I've decided after this. Um, but I'm, I'm going to ask our panellists, perhaps starting with Shakira, uh, just to give... Could you just give a... I know it's a hard thing to do, but just a very brief reflection on some of the debate that we've heard today and perhaps wrapping it up with your own thoughts. I mean... Yes. Well, as I said, it, it is difficult and awkward being 
forced into this defensive position, which Muslims have been forced into sort of defensive positions over a whole range of issues. And it's, um, you know, it makes for some strange alliances. <laughs> but it's, um, it puts me in the same camp as some people whose very conservative views with regard to gender issues I don't endorse. Um, and who are probably, I would say certainly, easily as uncomfortable at finding themselves metaphorically in bed with me. But, yes, but Muslim women need to have the space to find their own comfort zone over dress as over so many other issues. And talking about prohibitions is not the way to give that space. And uh, uh, one of my French friends was saying that in 1989, when there was, when politicians there first started to talk about prohibitions on hijab in schools, then a lot of girls started wearing it because it was, in Bronwyn Bishop's, you know, deathless words, an icon of defiance. Well, putting on the niqab as an icon of defiance, that's a rather more radical gesture and I suspect that a lot of girls who start wearing it for those reasons don't continue for any length of time. <laughs> but I wouldn't like to see the burqa achieving that same, you know, rebellious cachet, that same sartorial, you know, um, <coughs> status as much as I admire defiance in most circumstances. <laughs> there's defiance and there's just stupid, but you know. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Thanks very much, Shakira. Truly do want to um, like Shakira, I find myself um, sleeping with the enemy, so to speak, in, in this debate to an extent. And I started um, my interest in faith sprang from being raised as a conservative Anglican Christian. And um, while I still maintain some of those, um, those values and beliefs, I left the Anglican Church as a result of um, uh, feeling incredibly oppressed in the context of a debate around women's ordination in the early 90s. So that's, that's my background, which may make some of you think, how ironic then that I should defend what is perceived as, um, as such an act of oppression. But for all of the reasons outlined, I maintain that. And I have to say that when I first started looking at this issue as I did, to do a case study around the media's coverage of the hijab, my views were much more closely aligned with Virginia's. It's through several years of, of research and talking with Muslim women at length, which is something that as journalists you rarely get the chance to do in your daily practice in you know, the, the incredibly um, tumultuous world of the daily news feed. Um, but what, what I, this is my final conclusion, that the media tend to speak on behalf of or at Muslim women too frequently instead of speaking with them. And I, I do think the way forward is to build opportunities for dialogue, to build bridges, if you like, to encourage self-empowerment, rather than to um, blow up you know, such bridges through um, what tend to be divisive and counterproductive calls for bans on things like burqas or niqabs or hijabs. Um, and to many Muslim women, those calls and the debates that surround them can feel just as oppressive as the burqas themselves. And I think we need to, to think very carefully about the impacts um, of our discussions and our, the imposition of our own values and ideas and ideals um, on the people who we are dictating to. Thank you. The last word here to Virginia. Um, like Shakira and Julie, I also find myself metaphorically in bed with <coughs> strangers who I'm not comfortable <laughs> with at all. Um, it's very strange how, how this can happen, but uh, I guess I'm a little bit used to it. Um, <coughs> the, I'm looking forward to the time in Australia when um, uh, Muslim feminists are more outspoken about this issue. I've been waiting for that for some time and I'm not hearing a lot of it. The, the Muslim feminist um, uh, movement in France, the one that was, um, was initially run by Fidela Amara, who is now in, in government, it's called Not Whores Nor Submissives. They've been working for years and years. They grew out of the ghettos. And they've been working for years and years 
to actually stop the use of the hijab as well as the burqa because they believe that it is oppressive of women. And this is a feminist Muslim women's group. So I'm looking uh, forward... No, actually, I phoned their office and I said that I was interested in, work, in issues concerning Muslim women and they said in France... Sorry, my supervisor would do my, the accent much better. In France, we have lassite. And, and we don't use words like Muslim women. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it is all about lassite. But look, just mo moving on from that, um, there is... It, it is such a complex debate, and we could honestly, we could talk for weeks about this, but there has been a move uh, in Saudi Arabia just uh, late last year by one cleric by the name of Sheikh Mohammed al-Habadan, forgive my pronunciation, who's now calling for the one eye niqab. The one eye niqab. <laughs> I kid you not. And his reasoning is because showing both eyes is seductive and it allows women to use makeup. Now, I, I come back to my point. What is so terribly wrong with a woman's face, a woman's expression, and most importantly, what is so terribly wrong with a woman having free agency? That's my point, and that's what we need to keep in mind when we're talking about banning the burqa and the niqab in Australia. It is un-Australian. On, on your behalf, I'd like to thank uh, Virginia, Julie and Shakira, for, I think for really a wonderful discussion. I think the debate has been very, very rich. We could go on and on, and, uh, but we need to uh, leave the room now. But I'd like to thank you all for participating. The audience for some terrific questions, and I apologise again to all those people I couldn't get to, and also to our friends on uh, Twitter and uh, for tweeting away so uh, uh, generously there. So many thanks to everybody and to our panellists. <laughs>